So before we begin, I guess just a couple of comments about uh, some of you have come and talked to me about your projects. And if you're doing something uh, related to your research uh, or doing something uh, much more complicated than the, uh, than the uh, lab joint, then you, uh, my, I guess, general word of advice is try to, try to find a problem, the simplest possible problem that you can simulate first. If you go up uh, trying to simulate the most complicated thing right away, then you have no idea whether uh, your model is going to work or whether Abacus is going to converge or uh, what results you might be getting out of it are even meaningful or not. So um, try to build the simplest possible model first. Um, get something working, and then you can try to build upon that model and try to make it more complicated or uh, more realistic. And uh, so that way you should, you should have some sort of a reference point to go back to if things start to fail. Um, so that's one, uh, one thing about the project. Um, uh, on the homeworks, I'm practically done with your homework five and six. I'll go back and grade homework one through four uh, later. But um, it seems from the grading that uh, uh, quite a few of the codes were fairly similar. Um, so while I'm, it seemed like it was a little more uh, testing the boundaries of collaboration, uh, shall we say. Uh, so, but just a word, word of advice, if, you, if you're not comfortable with the code or uh, all the steps in the derivation of the weak form and how did you code it up, uh, you will have a very tough time on the exam. So uh, while I'm, I don't want to police the homeworks uh, like that, but make sure you understand each and every step of the code and uh, take a look at the solutions that I posted and um, so that at least you can, uh, you should be able to do it all by yourself. That was sort of the litmus test for collaboration. Okay, um, so next time we'll, uh, we'll go over uh, a review of what we did for chapter three and four, maybe solve a couple of problems. And if you have any problems from the homework uh, solutions or anything, uh, you can bring them uh, to Friday and on Monday. So other than that, uh, we'll just uh, go over a couple of uh, things on the beam theory today. Um, so are there any questions about the beam, beam theory that we did last couple of lectures? <coughs> Okay, uh, so let me just briefly go over what we were doing uh, last time and then we'll continue with that. Um, so we saw that um, for a planar beam, for a planar beam, um, if you write out the equations of equilibrium using this slice, so this slice of the beam is somewhere here. Ideally, it should be in the deformed configuration, but since we are uh, taking everything to be small strain, uh, we can assume that the deformed configuration is the same as the undeformed. So if you write out the equations of equilibrium for this slice, sum of moments, sum of the uh, forces, you come up with these three equations. Sum of, uh, so this is the uh, axial force equilibrium, this is transverse displacement equilibrium, um, and this is the equilibrium of moments. And here, this N, just like our div sigma plus B, this N is the applied axial body force. This is the applied uh, transverse body force. This is the applied uh, moment at every point in the beam. Uh, and usually this term does not occur in our uh, practical uh, everyday problems, so many times people will neglect this. And we also talked about some of this uh, distinction between the Bernoulli-Euler beam theory and the Timoshenko beam theory. So I told you that uh, this, this quantity, these are the strains. Um, this quantity theta bar, this is the curvature. This is the exact formula for the curvature in, um, for a planar beam. Um, and uh, so all these relations will be valid for a beam theory that includes the effect of shear, that kind of a beam theory that includes shear is called a Timoshenko beam uh, theory. And uh, the way we visualize that is that, let's say we have these infinitely many uh, fine cross sections along the axis of the beam. When it deforms, this axis 
this axis of the beam may be pointing in a different direction than the normal to the cross section. And if the, if the normal to the cross section, if two adjacent cross sections have slipped like this, that is shear. So if they slip, then this axis and the normal will not be pointing in the same direction. And uh, the angle that this cross section makes with the horizontal, that's the theta. And the rate of change of that angle is curvature. Uh, so that is the full shear beam theory. And when um, when we say that this W prime, that's the angle of this axis, is equal to theta, when, when this quantity is zero, then we get the Bernoulli-Euler beam theory. So in that case, we are assuming that the shear deformation is zero. Okay. Um, so for the Bernoulli-Euler beam theory, the cross section will always remain perpendicular to the to the centroid line. That's uh, that happens when you neglect the shear deformation. And then we took a look at uh, what are the governing equations for the Timoshenko beam theory. And I told you that there are actually three independent variables in this problem. You have u, the axial displacement at any point, w, which is the transverse displacement of any point, and theta, which is the rotation of this cross section. So you can independently approximate the, uh, the all these three quantities. u is the axial, w, uh, and theta on top of w. So this theta the rotation of this cross section is independent of the transverse displacement of the beam. Um, so we went over these boundary conditions. These are essential boundary conditions for a fixed free, a cantilever beam. These are natural boundary conditions where we, we are just saying that the axial load, the uh, transverse load, and the moment at the point L needs to be specified. Similarly, for simply supported, part of the degrees of freedom are essential, part of them are natural. Um, and we took a look at this weak form. So uh, essentially what we do in the weak form, we take our uh, governing differential equations, multiply that with a virtual displacement for the axial, this is for the transverse, and this is for the bending or rotation. And uh, you sum them up, do your integration by parts, uh, you will get these as the weak form, some boundary terms, and here again, you will see that uh, any time in a boundary term that you have this virtual quantity, uh, that will, uh, one of these ne needs to be specified. Either you need to specify this or you need to specify this for this weak form to be computable. Um, so when you specify that u prime is zero, that means there's an essential boundary condition there. Um, so similarly for w prime and theta prime. Um, so this is not very different from what you did for your uh, one-dimensional case in chapter one, um, because all those derivatives we saw, they are all first-order derivatives. So we also saw that um, the same functions that we used for chapter one, they can be used here. So the order of continuity of these equations is still H1. And uh, using this fact, you can choose certain uh, um, certain approximation functions for your Ritz method. And we, we briefly took a look at this cantilever problem. You have uh, this cantilever problem. These are the essential boundary conditions on the left end, the natural boundary conditions on the, on the right. And you're approximating your transverse displacement with a quadratic function of x. I told you that for Timoshenko beam, for shear beam theory, in general, the approximation for W is one order greater than the approximation for theta. So here you can see it, this is quadratic and this is linear. This could be cubic and this could be quadratic and so on. And if we make them equal order uh, interpolation, let's say we use both linear, linear or quadratic, quadratic, then uh, the formulation tends to lock up. You do not get the full displacement of the tip. Uh, um, so so that's basically how you would uh, choose approximations for uh, for the Timoshenko, for the shear beam theory. And let's take a look at this Bernoulli-Euler beam theory. So I, just like I told you, uh, in this theory, we choose that the cross-section will always remain perpendicular to this 
centroid line. So W bar and theta, they are both equal. And that means that the shear uh, is zero. Um, and if we take uh, if we take this fact and plug this back into our equilibrium equations, you will see that the axial equation remains the same. Um, and the bending moment equation, that will, uh, what you can do is differentiate it one more time and you will get Q prime, right? E I W double prime, the, uh, another prime, and you will get Q prime plus M prime. And I think in this, there is this one prime missing. If you have that in your notes, uh, make that change. So, um, so for the Bernoulli Euler beam theory, we have reduced our problem from uh, three equilibrium equations to two. One is the axial equilibrium. That's the same old thing. And now we just have a combined equation for transverse and bending uh, equilibrium. So essentially, this is the equation that we solve in our, uh, for our beam, uh, beam kind of problems. And um, so a couple of things here. Uh, since we have eliminated theta, we actually uh, lose this constitutive equation. We are saying that the two sections, two adjacent cross sections cannot slip. That means that they are rigid. They cannot slip with respect to each other. Um, so there is no need for this constitutive equation. In, uh, in fact, this term goes to zero. And G, the shear modulus, goes to infinity. So uh, you lose this equation. So the only way that we can calculate shear at a cross section is going to be from equilibrium or statics. Basically, uh, what we are saying is um, you take the original equilibrium equation for, uh, for moments, and you can calculate Q back from that. So Q, you will see that is proportional to the third derivative of the transverse displacement. Moment is proportional to the second derivative, W double E I W double prime is the moment basically. Q is minus E I W triple prime if E I is constant and if there is no uh, applied moments. Okay. So generally, uh, in most of the problems, you will see that shear is denoted by this quantity. Um, all right, uh, so let's take a look at how the boundary conditions change uh, for the two simple cases that we talked about. One is this cantilever beam, a uh, fixed free. Um, so the boundary conditions for the axial and the transverse remain the same. But for bending, since we have eliminated theta, theta is equal to W prime, we have a second boundary condition on W. So not only W has to be zero at this point, but also the rate of change of W with, in, with respect to X, that is the rotation of the centroid line, that has to be zero. And similarly, N, Q, and M, they are defined differently in this, uh, in this Bernoulli Euler beam. So the axial load, the, uh, the transverse load, and the bending moment, or the applied end moment has to be specified. Uh, for the natural boundary condition in this case. Um, and similarly for the, uh, for the simply supported beam, you have U0, W0, that makes sense. It cannot move horizontally or vertically. But the applied moment at this end needs to be specified. It could be specified to be zero, which is what we have usually in our simply supported beams. But this this is the moment that needs to be specified at, uh, at this point. So similarly here, we need to specify the moment and we need to specify the axial force and that the transverse displacement is zero. So this is, uh, these are the boundary conditions for these two sets of equations. You have a second order equation here. For that, you need two boundary conditions. You have a fourth order equation here. So for that, you need four boundary conditions, okay? So in, in total, what you have is two boundary conditions for uh, the axial part and four boundary conditions for, uh, for your transverse and bending equation. So, so this is basically the strong form of the equations for your Bernoulli Euler beam. Um, and once again, what we'll do is we'll write the weak form um, like this. So uh, 
we take our axial equation, multiply it with virtual displacement, take our transverse bending equation, multiply it with virtual transverse displacement, and you uh, integrate it by parts and so on. So um, that's where we pretty much stopped uh, last time. Um, so what we'll do today is we'll just concentrate on this bending part. We know that this axial part is actually decoupled from this equation. They are, these are pretty much two different equations. So you could write the weak form for this equation independently. And that's what we have here. So the weak form for the real transverse displacement and the virtual transverse displacement is just this equation multiplied with this W bar. And now you need to integrate this by parts. So you will see that since there are four derivatives on W in this equation, you need to transfer two of them over to the virtual displacement. So this is a little bit different from what we had in our chapter one. Um, you, you need to integrate it once, you will get this. One of the derivatives comes over to W prime, and you get one boundary term. You integrate it another, integrate it by parts another time, this derivative also comes over here, and what you're left with is this term here. This term doesn't change much. And you get another boundary term. OK? And that's the reason that you need actually four boundary conditions. So either you need to specify that this is 0 at 0 or L, or you need to specify that this is 0 at 0 at L. So let me ask you this. Um, if I say that this W bar is 0, both at 0 and L, what does that physically mean? Which, which type of boundary, uh, which type of beam is this? So if W bar is 0, uh, that means W needs to be specified. That's the transverse displacement at both 0 and L needs to be specified. So uh, immediately you can say that this is uh, the transverse displacement is, uh, it needs to be specified at both, so it's not the fixed free. It is uh, similar to the, uh, to the simply supported. But in addition, if you say that um, this quantity, um, or let's say this quantity, so let's say W bar is specified, and W bar prime, both are specified at 0 and L. What would that be? be? Right, so it would be fixed, fixed. Um, you can specify the displacement here and the rotation here, and you can specify the displacement and rotation here. So if both of these are specified, that would be a fixed, fixed beam. Let's say if this is specified and you uh, specify this at 0 and L, what would that be? So I'm saying that the virtual displacement is 0 at 0 and L. And this quantity, this is the moment which is specified at 0 and L. So this would be simply supported. Simply supported beam, uh, that's what we had here. Your W is 0 at 0, WL is 0. You have, spe you have specified that the vertical displacement is 0. In addition, you need to specify the moment. What, what is the applied moment at 0? What is the applied moment at L? So that's the simply supported beam. Um, so so uh, basically, for any weak form, you will get these four boundary conditions. You have, uh, and you can mix and match depending upon what uh, the actual physical problem is. You can get different types of uh, beams. Sometimes actually there are mixed boundary conditions. Um, so if there, if there is a spring at 0 uh, or L, if there is a rotational spring, those, those kinds of uh, boundary conditions will need to be included in this case. So for example, um, let's say if I have a rotational spring here. This is a simply supported beam and I have a rotational spring here. Then if you draw the free body diagram of this part N, uh, this end part, then you can express the applied moment in terms of the rotational spring. 
and that is the quantity that will uh, go in here. So, um, and that spring stiffness that is going to go and contribute to the stiffness matrix of your uh, of your original beam. So, this might be better to take uh, take a couple of uh, examples with this. So, okay. So, before we uh, go ahead with that. Um, what is the order of continuity of the shape of, the, of these functions w? So essentially, what our weak form is saying is that this quantity g, if this quantity g is zero for all functions w, if I can show that this g is zero for any w you choose, then I know that my equilibrium equation is satisfied. So what is the uh, what is the space of functions that I can choose w from? when is this weak form well defined right so it would be h2 0 because we have double derivatives of uh, of this transverse displacement so so the space that is required uh, space of functions that you can choose it from uh, it needs to be h2 now um, so what type of functions are eliminated? Uh, let's say if I have a beam, I divide this beam into many parts, and if I choose my hat functions, finite element hat, sh hat shape functions, is that a valid choice for this? It's not a valid choice because uh, if you take the derivative of that uh, finite element shape function, so something like this, let's say, let's say this is my beam. I divide it into three, three parts and my finite element shape functions are something like this. So clearly the derivative, the first derivative of this uh, shape function will be a constant line. Um, so let me draw that with the red. So this would be a constant line uh, um, here and here and this would be the first derivatives of these functions. Um, if you take the second derivative now that second derivative is not defined at this point of discontinuity. So, uh, so consider this function. That function has derivatives like this. There is a discontinuity here. So, if you try to square integrate that, uh, or you, if you try to find the derivative of that, that will have a infinite uh, value right at this point of discontinuity, and you cannot uh, double or square integrate. Uh, an infinite Dirac delta function. So these types of functions are eliminated. How about uh, how about our three-noded triangle, a uh, three-noded uh, linear element, uh, three-noded line element? That is quadratic. Is that a valid choice for these problems? So let's say again. Um, let me make a little space here. So we have the same beam, and we divide it into two elements. But both of these two elements, they are three-noded line elements, um, like this. And the shape functions, what they look like on this uh, on this beam is something like this. So, if I put all of these shape functions together, um, do I still get uh, something that belongs to H2? So, actually we will not get uh, an H2 function because if you take a look at this, um, let me move this down a little bit. So. If you consider the shape function for this node, this shape function looks like this, right? And the derivatives of the shape function would be something like this. Um, I think I need to make some more space, but let's see. So the derivative of this shape function would be something like this. And the other shape function derivative would be
something like this. So the idea is that uh, the shape function starts out negative here. So let's say this is the zero line. Um, what I'm saying here is that the shape function starts out negative with a negative slope. So that's why we have a negative slope here. Then it starts to become positive and it ends up here. For this part of the curve, the slope is negative and it starts to become positive here. So once again, you see that, that, that there is a discontinuity in the derivatives. So even the, the three noted linear uh, line element is not a valid choice for, uh, for our shape functions um, for these bending problems. So we need to make sure that any function that we choose, it must have continuous derivatives. So uh, any, anywhere where the shape function has a kink, it, it, the shape function itself is continuous, but its derivative is not continuous. So we need to make sure that the derivative of those shape functions is continuous at each and every point along the beam. So that's the, uh, that's the consequence of having this H2 space. Since it is a fourth order equation, we need to have H2 space, which means that not only the function needs to be continuous, but the derivatives also need to be continuous. All right, um, so let's take a look at this example. We have this cantilever beam, and we'll try to solve it with the Ritz method. So in the Ritz method, you, if you remember, all we do is we uh, approximate the real displacement with a discretized displacement, which is expressed as A0 plus a linear combination of some functions, right? Um, so in this case, the functions uh, that we choose, again, need to belong to uh, the space where their derivatives are continuous. Um, all right, so what should I choose? Let's say this, this is the problem that I have, cantilever beam. Um, uh, the boundary conditions are also given. So what are these two boundary conditions? That the displacement, vertical displacement here is zero, and the vertical rotation at this point is zero. So are these essential boundary conditions or natural? So these are essential boundary conditions. And these two are natural boundary conditions. These two just say that there is no point load applied at the end here. So this is E minus EI W triple prime. This is the shear or the transverse load applied at L that is specified to be zero. The moment and moment applied is also specified to be zero. There is only one uniformly distributed load Q naught here. So, so what should I choose for A zero? I need to I need to approximate my displacement of the beam. This beam is going to displace something like this. Um, what should I choose for A zero? So if I just choose zero, that is fine. That satisfies both the essential boundary conditions. Um, so A0 is zero. How about H? Uh, let's say we are just going to choose one, uh, uh, I is equal to one, or uh, N is equal to one. So we'll just stay with one, um, one function. So what should I choose for H1 of X? Can I choose? Can I choose something like this? Linear. Does it satisfy the essential boundary condition? That's the, that's the whole uh, question, right? Uh, this H functions that I choose need to, uh, need to uh, satisfy the essential boundary conditions. So it does satisfy the W is equal to zero at this point. But since it is a linear function, its derivative is not zero. Right, so you cannot choose this linear function uh, as your uh, any function h that you choose must specify must satisfy all the essential boundary conditions. So you cannot choose this linear function. What you can choose is a quadratic, something like this. 
let's say we choose h is equal to x square and um, so our approximation for the transverse displacement that is going to be equal to a1 times x square because uh, a0 a0 is 0 so the same uh, if we use uh, the Galerkin method then the same approximation will hold true for the virtual displacement um, so all right let me ask you another question uh, at this stage what um, if I choose this as only one term in the Ritz approximation what is the size of my stiffness matrix going to be So the stiffness matrix is going to come out from this term, right? And I'm saying that W is simply H H1, which is x square, A1 times x square. So my stiffness matrix is just going to be one cross one, okay? Um, all right. So let's and all that we do, all that we need to do now is to just plug this approximation into our uh, weak form and see, uh, see what the solution comes out to be for this cantilever beam. So we have this G, WW bar is equal to um, integral 0 to L, A1 bar X square. Um, actually, what we need here is w double prime so if i take the double derivative of this w what is that going to be 2a1 similarly w bar double prime is 2a1 bar so uh, what i will be left with in here is ei times 2 times 2 a1 and minus 0 to L A1 bar X square times 2 naught DL DL that's the that's what you would get if you were to substitute if you were to substitute our Ritz approximation into this weak form because this is this term is 0 both of the uh, all the boundary terms are zero because uh, this term is specified to be zero at zero and actually this right so let, uh, wh why are the bind all these four boundary conditions zero at the left end w zero is specified to be zero which makes w bar also zero at at zero right and at the left end we also have this w bar the real displacement is specified to be zero which makes this quantity zero and similarly uh, we have specified moments at both of these uh, so uh, at at l the shear is specified to be zero this is the shear at l is zero and the moment at l is zero that's why all these four terms go to zero okay um, so this is the weak form that we have now if we just integrate it out let's see what we get uh, we get four ei um, and there is an a1 bar sitting out there Four E I L this is the stiffness matrix four E I L and my unknown vector is A one, simply A one. There's uh, just one unknown and minus zero to L of uh, X square that is going to give me what? L cube over three. times q naught this is my 
equation that needs to be satisfied for all a1 bar. Is that sound correct or is there any calculation mistake here? Um, here, so for EI, yeah, sorry, that, that's EI. Uh, so this is our stiffness matrix K. This is our unknown back, unknown displacement D. This is our F. So essentially, even for beam problems, uh, whenever you use Ritz method or finite element methods, you get the same type of equation uh, again. And if you solve this, you get a1 is equal to um, q naught L square over 12 EI, which means that your W, so this is not the solution, this is not the final solution. You need to go back and find what W was. This W was A1 times X square. So this would be Q naught L square X square over 12 EI. So this is the solution that you get for the transverse displacement along the length of the beam. Um, so is the sign of this uh, uh, is the sign of this quantity correct? We've uh, uh, we had applied this. Q naught in the negative direction, but uh, essentially, what uh, if you remember, that's why uh, the load that we uh, uh, in our in our equilibrium equation we denoted the load to be pointing upwards. So if you assume that Q naught is let's say negative 10 or something, then um, uh, you need to basically what I'm saying here is you need to uh, be careful about the sign, uh, even though I have drawn it opposite. The Q naught from our equilibrium equation that we had uh, defined before was pointing up positive. So as long as Q naught is positive, W bar should also be positive. Okay. Um, so how does this compare with the exact solution? How uh, how can we find the exact solution? Um, how do we find the exact solution for this problem? What would be the governing differential equation? We have uh, EI, W prime, W double prime. The whole thing double prime is equal to Q naught. Isn't this the governing differential equation? Uh, if you go back uh, up, I think, um, on this page, this is the governing differential equation. There is no M in this problem. So EIW double prime is equal to Q, which is specified to be a constant Q naught. Right? So we take this equation, and we just simply start to integrate this. This is, uh, this is an equation that we can integrate. So if we do that, what do we get after one integration? Q naught x plus C1. Um, 